Uh, nice. Um, so I will start somewhat unorthodox by first indicating some selected works I used when preparing this presentation today. Uh, usually speakers have them at the end, but I wonder, I would rather have some questions screened for the discussion than having those uh, uh, selected references. These are, of course, only the tip of the iceberg, and uh, their function here is to illustrate that the discussion that I'm going to tackle today has been long rooted in the historiographical tradition. Now, as disclaimed in my abstract, I mm -hmm. would avoid offering um, my own yet another interpretation of the Thane Lerunian conscriptions from the historical point of view. Um, that is to say that I shall try not to speculate who or what those people called Thanes in those inscriptions actually were. This is not my main focus today. This will be tackled in my future, hopefully, uh, PhD thesis. My motivation today will follow one of the next slides, but uh, for now I should like to state that my intention is as following. I'm going to share with you some of my ready-made observations on the relevant source material and then pose a few topically specific narrow questions that I hope you as specialists in the field might be able to help me answer. Now, to simplify, I'm taking a step back from building a historical narrative and instead pursue some actual source criticism today. Now, um, this tightly packed slide you can see here is a capsule version of the historiographical debate about the Scandinavian Thanes. And long story short, before the year 1927, this was simply not a topic for academic discussion. But that year, Danish historian and archivist Sven Okia published a well-written article that opened and sparked a long established controversy. And in 1945, Renologist Karl, Karl Martin Nielsen refuted Okia's uh, arguments from a source critical perspective. Ever since then, scholarship has been divided between these two polar positions. Okia claimed that Thanes and Drains, um, and here I will take a little step sideways, I will pronounce those words in an English way. So I will say Drains, not Dränger or Drängar or whatever, and I will say Thanes. Uh, as we say in modern English, but of course, if you feel not comfortable with that, please let me know. Anyway, um, sometimes people sometimes people in, in insist on calling them Thainer or Thainas. I'm not having any stance here. Anyways, um, Oke claimed that Thanes and Drains were members of the king's retinues, whereas Nielsen maintained that this is a forced reading of the laconic sources. Skipping a few important stages that you can read here on my slide, I'll briefly retell my own historiographical research from my 2018 article. It seems that the debate has been revolving around a hoax from the beginning. You see, Nielsen, as I mentioned, pointed out the largest weakness in his opponent's argumentation. That is that the runic conscriptions alone do not allow Oki's reading by themselves. Understanding that, Oki built his whole argument on comparisons with the Anglo-Saxon precedent and to prove that drains were a lower stratum of the things, and that was one of his punchlines that was essential to his argumentation. He resorted to a text that we today call Constituones de Foresta, and Ockley mistakenly believed it to stem from Canute's reign, but in reality it was composed in the late 12th century by an apparent non-native English speaker who clearly didn't know his Old Norse from Old English, and um, there definitely was some um, pronounced ideological agenda behind that text. It had nothing to do with King Canute whatsoever. It just drew on King Canute as sort of a precursor to the Norman conquest. The bottom line is that this whole debate has been built on a false premise from the beginning. Why from the beginning? Because what I'm telling you about this, uh, con these Constituents de Forest had been established by Felix Lieberman in 1897. Ocker or 95, if I'm not mistaken. Ocker never knew about that, it seems, because he referred to that text as valid mm -hmm. in his very last article published in Politiken uh, in Copenhagen a few weeks before he passed away in 1962. Um, so if you remove the Constituones de Foresta from the equation, the whole construction will simply fall apart. Um, I will now share my own understanding of um, why studying things is nevertheless important. To grossly oversimplify, they seem to act as a social and political elite in modern sociological terms. 
Thus, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, they had a say in acknowledging Swain Fogbit as the English king in the year 1013. And uh, in 1035, rich and poor Norwegian thanes chose Magnus Olofsson, um, the Norwegian king. This is, however, reported by a much, much later Fagerskina, which opens an alternative that we might be actually dealing with a linguistic, not a social phenomenon, perhaps both at the same time, which I believe warrants studying the Nordic things ever more. First, the very Gordian knot that I alluded to earlier must be cut, and second, this is indeed what we ought to establish whether there actually is any social reality behind this lag seam in Scandinavia or not. Uh, and like I said, I myself have not drawn any major historical conclusions yet, which is why I would like to share my ideas with you. So the problem for a very long time has been that um, things have been used um, sort of a support for very different speculations or theorization without elaborated argumentation. And as Mikael is going to mention today, I hope uh, <clears throat> there exist uh, strong doubts based on some syntactical <clears throat> patterns of the social dimension behind the word in question. In spite of this, some very far-reaching conclusions regarding political and social history of the Viking Age have been frequently drawn. My own ambition in my PhD project is, among many other things, to, uh, to bridge this gap and to introduce some neurological knowledge to the problem which I hope to probably achieve with your help also today. Picture time. Um, the slide that you can see on the screen summarizes the relevant corpus. Altogether, we are dealing with 73 inscriptions, uh, save some problematic readings. There are some corrupted readings that are sometimes um, listed among the relevant ones, but I excluded them if they are too corrupted to be um, univocally uh, called thinly runic inscriptions. Of these 73, 47 are instances of a common noun in uh, the commemorative formulae, mostly concentrated in northeast Jutland and Vesterjutland, as you can see. There is a cluster here, there is a pronounced cluster here. Um, 19 occurrences, 13 of which are in Upland alone, are instances of a proper personal name, and I should mention that the element Thane is also found in a few compound names, Far Thane. Finally, Södermanland contains seven unique stones that call the commemorated Throtter Thane, Thane of Thiagen, which literally translates to a Thane of Strength. What this means is, un is not clear, but Judas Jash from the University of Nottingham, who seems to be the only scholar to touch on this, believes this to be a metaphor to Odin's warriors. Uh, again, I do not have a real stance here. I do agree that this is clearly a metaphor. This is not a literal meaning, but uh, what exactly it alludes to might never be resolved after all. Uh, regardless, I will now demonstrate a few samples organized west to east and no special preference in my selection governed my choice, to actually be honest. DR143 stems from Jutland and commemorates one Apa or Eba, a good thane and father of the sponsor. It's a nice, uh, here's a nice drawing from a, um, no, um, Mason Thane Gordon, um, uh, yeah, my mis my my mistake. It, it's 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 a relative. My mistake. It's a uh, what is it called? Uh, the Mahar. The, uh, it's his stepfather. St probably step. Yeah, w we would assume from this context. Yes, I I copied the wrong the wrong uh, the wrong text here in my, in my presentation. Anyway, uh, this is a nice this is a nice drawing from a nineteenth century edition, as far as I remember. Uh, now. Another stone, this time from Vesterjotland. This is my own picture from a few weeks ago. This was discovered in 1996 in Hull, uh, in Hull during a restoration in the local parish church. The commemorated again is father to the sponsors and a very good thane. How do the golden thane, whatever that means. Here's another similar stone also from Vesterjotland. Um, it calls the deceased also the father of the sponsors a very good thane. Please note a common feature, very often our stones mention Thane's women, their wives or mothers to their common offspring. Um, 
this Sodom and Landic stone is interesting because it mentions two good <coughs> things who were brothers to the sponsors and died somewhere in the east in Austerwecker. Finally, here is an example of a Throtter thane stone. It is also peculiar because of the mask image on the top section, right here. And as far as I know, there are only three such instances in the whole corpus, I mean, <coughs> of those seven inscriptions that mention Throtter thane, um, or Thainer. Um, there are only three with that, with that kind of mask. Um, right. Of course, I would, be the f I would be far from the first scholar to aim high and aim at identifying patterns in those 73 inscriptions. There are three bird's eye view observations from my predecessors that I wholeheartedly agree with because they are, in my opinion, simply impossible to refute. So two come from Judas Jash, whom I already mentioned. First, she maintains that the stones on which Thane is used as an appellative demonstrate interest for familial relationships and land ownership. She departs from the fact that all mentioned Thanes are relatives of the sponsors, most of them fathers, but also husbands. And we could speculate that those were well-to-do local establishments simply because of what, a, what raising a runestone entails. It's a very rich, a very lavish, a very expensive, symbolic, uh, memorial, not everyone could afford it, so we can kind of speculate that whomever could afford raising such a stone was probably a local wealth man, and if you have a lot of wealth, you probably own a lot of land. Uh, but this is again sort of a, a bit of an intellectual yoga, so to speak. Uh, this is not my expression. Um, uh, she also observed that different inscriptions mention different kinds of monuments. So she, meant she assembled the information about Kummer, Steiner, and uh, Monument Cemetery, cemetery a Bridge, or Ship Settings. And as far as, I, as far as I know, she was the first one to actually point our attention in this direction. And finally, it is impossible to overlook that of the 47 relevant inscriptions, 40 call their things good or something similar. We have 36 Gother, 1 Al Gother, 2 Best, uh, 1 Furster, 1 Nutter, 1 Heidwerder, and we also have those throtter, seven of which, but like I said, those throtter things are unique. But yeah, the majority are called good things, and we shall come to this later. Now, the third observation that I also agree with belongs to Karl Löving, whom I shall probably mention a few times during our discussion too, uh, who puts this very good formula in, on an actual map right here. Uh, I disagree with his conclusion that this has anything to do with King Canute's domain, but the pronounced area is evidently there. Now, I, un I underline the part that I agree with because, again, it's geography, but I do not really think that this alone has to say anything about King Canute or King Swain Fogby because I believe this is just going in circles. Oh, they were the overlords of southern Scandinavia. How do we know that? Because of those stainless inscriptions. And those stainless inscriptions um, also mean that uh, they must have been overlords. So we're just reach a dead end, uh, basically. And uh, you, you might actually accuse me of oversimplifying or of making fools of them. First of all, Karl Loving and Peter Sawyer. But if you actually read their text closely, this is roughly the argumentation they follow. So it's I would say going in circles, which is exactly what I'm trying to break loose from today. Trying to break loose from this political, from this, this, this historical discussion. I, I'm, I would like to concentrate on the runological part per se, because neither Loving nor Sawyer, either, either Bega Sawyer or Peter Sawyer were anologists. They were, Carl Loving is still is a, an archeologist and uh, the Sawyers were historians. Uh, I mean, Peter Sawyer was his, uh, historian, Bega Sawyer, of course, was a runologist, uh, but I mean, Peter had the most influential ideas about those things. Now, um, moving on, I equally disagree with Loving's opposition of the Thane Le Rune stones and place names Thaneboo. Here's a map from one of his uh, articles. I added some colors to it, but the map is entirely his. Uh, in a personal, in a private conversation, he mentioned that he traveled to all those 16 places. I'm not sure about Finland, but in West Jutland, he said he, he had visited them all. At first glance, 
there seems to be a sort of uh, a pattern. But if we compare those Thainabus with the distribution of similar toponymic formations, Kalibu, Sveinabu, Rinkabu, which is right over here, this similarity seems to fade away. Uh, at the same time, I refuse to see any significance in the distribution of all such place names as does Matke Larsen, from whom I got this map. Uh, the only certainty on this map is that there seems to form no pattern whatsoever. If you actually take a look, we can only see that well, the majority is concentrated more towards the north. And that's the only, that's the only pattern that I myself can observe. Um, moreover, um, as Mikkel and I discussed a few days ago, there are serious reservations to connect uh, such toponyms with military retinues, the comitatus, as has frequently been done since the late 19th century. Perhaps those Thena, Karla, and Sveina are genitive singular or personal masculine names of the weak declension, so that the uh, nominative would be Thaini, Sveini, and uh, Karli. As for the Rinkebu or Rikebu, Mikkel has suggested that it refers to natural features such as wrinkles that occur all the time in post Ice Age sed sedimentary landscapes, and in Icelandic, the uh, cognate word would be Hruka. But I have to disclaim, I'm not a linguist myself, so this is second-hand knowledge. Uh, if anyone has anything to bring to the table in this discussion, I would very much welcome it, because I've been reading on this uh, for, I wouldn't say years, but months definitely, and it seems that the discussion has been just reiterating the statements first expressed in the late 19th century. The question also arises, why people interpreted those Thainabus, Rinkibus, and so forth as the retinue places. Uh, Mikkel and I discussed that probably people read Beowulf too much, uh, which was made available in Swedish at the time, in the late 19th century, because from, uh, from the toponymical evidence alone, there's basically nothing to go with. Uh, Löving maintains that those were four posts and fortified uh, sites uh, along the trade route that uh, King uh, Swain controlled. Yeah, this is probable, but how to explain that? So, are those also fortified places? Mats Gilassen believes they are, but Mats Gilassen completely turns the whole argument upside down. He believes that this was a trade route not from from west to east, but from east to west, and those were those were located along the rivers that were used to uh, communicate. Uh, from Upland all the way to Jotland, and that those were kind of the predecessors of the Rothsmen that went to Rus uh, or to Eastern Europe and gave us the word, presu pre presumably gave us the word Rus. Again, Mats uh, as far as I know, made a similar boat trip himself. Uh, that at least he claims uh, in, an, in a popular article from which I retrieved this picture. But um, we have heard of the mistake of the survivor, if you know what I mean. So again, this is all very controversial to me. Uh, if I were hypercritical, or supercritical, not hypocritical, if I was, <laughs> if I was supercritical, I would simply discard this altogether. I would simply mention, yeah, we have some Tainabus, we have also Kalibu, Sainabu, Rinkibu. But what this all means and how this all configures is beyond our understanding, or at least my understanding. Um, anyway, uh, what my own observations? What are my own observations? You might ask. Well, I would like to re to reiterate that I abstain from historical conclusions just yet, at least today, and that this slide overviews my source critical generalizations. First of all, I fully agree with Judith Jesh that things should be separated from drains. Um, she referred to an article by the archaeologist Søren Sindbæk, which I haven't read, to my shame, uh, but I found an even neater ground. Um, this was an erroneous supposition by Sven Okja based on his false understanding of Constitutionis de Foreste, because in, all, in, in well, Middle English, actually, drains could be paired with a whole number of other synonyms, like uh, we have Swain, Freeman, Knicht, or Knight, or Milles, or Smallemanus, and this only a position occurs in that particular text, which comes from the late 12th century, has nothing to do with King Canute. And even then, it also hinges on a very, very loose chain of mutual um, concessions. 
Orkia referred to Johannes Steenstrup, who Orkia said established that uh, the word yeoman was uh, an English synonym to the loan word dränger because they mean the same thing, a young person. Uh, spoiler, Johannes Steenstrup didn't prove that because he also went in circles and he basically used the same arguments that Orkia used, but Orkia, Orkia ha held a degree in English and so he was very accurate and very careful in his formulations. So if you read, if you read his text, it would appear that Johannes Steenstrup uh, maintained it 100% certainly, but when I actually check what he wrote, well, it's all hot air, I would say. Anyway, and secondly, uh, so if we believe, okay, if we believe that Jomen and Drenger is one and the same word, then we have this phrase, mediocres homines quos angli lestein is nun cupan, dani very young men vocant. Okay, lots of problems here. Lestein is never, never attested in the whole Anglo-Saxon corpus whatsoever besides that. And unus testis, tus, testis nullis, we know that. Secondly, uh, dani very young men vocant. Uh, you can probably see what the problem is. Uh, young, yeoman is not a, an Old Norse word. The author of this text sim simply didn't know his Old Norse from his Old English. So this is all very loose. And if you remove, like I said, if you remove Constituonis de Forrester from this equation, this whole opposition simply falls apart. Because I believe that, it, that there's simply no connection between the Thanes and the Drangs in the runic corpus whatsoever. We don't have any personal name, Dranger. Yes, we do. Do we do? Uh, okay, I checked the some notice Gurun data bus yesterday. I might have overlooked it. And this is something I would like to return to mm -hmm. in my final slide. Uh, because I, w I was also a bit, uh, a bit concerned about that because we have this name in Rixula, where it is specifically in the same line as with the Thane. So I'm kind of not very sure myself. Uh, but again, 19 Thanes as personal names and only one, you said, Henrik, in, in, of Dringer. So there's kind of a problem here. Uh, we don't have any drain abuse, by the way, that we, that we do not have. Um, the geographic distribution seems to be inconsistent. Yes, uh, in the areas where we find the Thanes, normally we find the drains, but the majority of the draining room stones are concentrated in the east. Uh, in the east, we have much fewer, uh, far fewer things, and this whole formula, Heart of the Golden, is simply absent there. So I believe it's a super, superficial correlation, simply not there. We just read too much into it. Um, secondly, I was wondering if the Verilex seem Thane could have been a loan word from, for example, Old English, as some would have us believe. And here, like I said before, I'm not a linguist, I depart from what uh, Jan Paul Stried had to say in his 1987 article. He maintained that the word Thane, in the form that it is recorded in, could not have been a loan word because it underwent the breaking of the stressed uh, Proto-Germanic long E into Ya. Uh, what I, what I as a historian did, I actually looked at our distribution. Long story short, it seems that the distribution seems to be 50-50, uh, and there's no general pattern that I could have been able to, uh, to uh, that I was able to observe. So some runic inscriptions have breakings, some do not. If we take the earliest manuscripts, out of four mentionings, uh, out of ten mentions, four are broken. That sounds funny. Um, not to mention that some of those 10 uh, uh, attestations are actually reconstructions because the manuscripts themselves are a bit corrupt. Mm -hmm. If, however, there's, there's one pattern still. If, however, we look at the Old West Norse sources, that is the Skaldic verse and the um, Norwegian and Icelandic laws, no breaking whatsoever. Always thin, always long, long. Um, is, there a, is that a pattern? Maybe. I myself abstain from drawing magic conclusions, and if you ask me if we had a loan word here or if it was an, an, an indigenous development, I would say uh, at least I do not know. Um, could have been both. Maybe it was both. Maybe it could have been borrowed by some people, but maybe some people have learned it from their parents. Maybe they borrowed it and then it underwent breaking. Again, I'm not a linguist here, but what I'm just saying is that it's a bit ambiguous. Second, and finally, uh, finally, I'm not the first one to observe that the relevant uh, stones are particularly concentrated in four regions. So, um, as a common noun, Thane appears in the formulae almost exclusively from northeast Jutland and south of the Lake Vannon. As a proper name, it is largely res uh, reserved for uh, Upland. 
and in the component of this weird Throttorthane formula, it appears only in Söderman land. My conclusion is that this bears no actual social significance. This is There's no clear-cut pattern that I, as a historian, could see. This brings me to my speculation that what we might be dealing with is just some local fashions or traditions, uh, maybe both, and nothing else. And that is my, again, this is not my historical conclusion. I'm trying to be a source critic here. So, having said that, I would really love and appreciate to discuss the following questions that I brought onto the slide. Basically, I am mo I'm most interested in the long-established datings, especially after Anne-Sophie's contribution to the Atlantic and, and uh, Gothlandic, Yotlandic um, uh, corpus, uh, because as Mikkel and I discussed, many of those datings have been established back in the early 20th century, and they could be subject to revision. Um, secondly, I also wonder if the information in the Sam Nordisk Rund text database is reliable in this respect, and this is what just Hendrik pointed out, that there's, there's the name Dringer, which I could have overlooked. But again, as far as I understand, Sam Nordisk is based on the printed editions, as far as I understand, and the datings in those, and, and the readings in those dated editions are, I wouldn't say outdated, but they might be subject to revision, like I said. Uh, Mikkel could probably also add something about the famous Glavenrup stone, where this leith hole, this whole thing about leith seems to be also a superficial reading. Um, and, um, of importance is locate, locating the stones in the landscapes and the possible implications thereof. And finally, uh, if I'm right in my hypothesis that we actually might be observing a mere runographic fashion, can and most importantly should it be explained. I'm looking forward to a long and fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry.